podcast app? Well, not the podcast app, the podcast itself, the Who, What, Why podcast. And I know that you're always uploading your own podcast from your website and also other interviews you do. And uh, it's just, it's amazing every time you hear, I hear you speak, anytime you do an interview, it's just, it's amazing the uh, amount of information you, you stored w- throughout these years and, and, uh, and hold. And uh, I just, thanks again. I really appreciate it. I'm sure um, myself and the listeners are going to learn some stuff today. Well, happy to do it. And uh, so let's start off with something that happened not too long ago. I know you were covering the Boston bombings. And it's funny how how emotional people get when we talk about that topic. Because it seems like a lot of times, because I'd be paying attention to the work you're doing on the Who, What, Why website. And I would bring up some of the questions you guys would bring up uh, when I was with friends and when the trial was going on. And it's amazing how quickly people just jump to, to basically just saying you're crazy it's obvious it's cut and dry you know what happened you know those guys are terrorists there's pictures of them with the uh you know isis like style flag there's you know they obviously did it and all this stuff and is did you see kind of or did you have similar issues with like trying to i guess question some of these stories like people were looking at you like why are you questioning this it's it's uh do you think it it was emotional thing or, or what do you think it was Yeah, I am not a psychologist or a psychiatrist, but I can certainly uh, say that when powerful emotional events take place, and and it can be tremendous happiness or sadness or terror or any of these things, uh, our minds are not running our body. Uh, The chemicals are. And... um, Uh, the manipulation of human beings via a whole bunch of different stimuli, visual, uh, oral, all of these different kinds of things, uh, they create uh, uh, an automatic response. And this has been understood by those who sought to rule other people throughout history. If you go all the way back, there were, even in in ancient times, there were methods to do that. Um, And if you think about the waving the red flag in front of the bull, it's really something like that. And and, and I think we all know that when we get, let's say, for example, really, really mad about something, we're no longer rational. And uh, these kinds of events... Uh, there is a the the uh, there is a need on the part of each of us as individuals to to reconcile and settle the discomfiture and the terror. We need certainty and we need closure. And this is not even a, a choice. So it's not something we're, we're choosing to do. So our tendency, when anything alarming happens, is to take the simplest explanation from those who say that they will protect us. And so uh, when when someone else comes along and says, now hold on for a second, how do we know we're actually safe? How do we know it's been solved or settled? How do we know uh, that there is not more to it? The instant reaction is, is anger at the messenger, so-called kill the messenger. And I think that's what we see in these things as a member of the media, uh, I've experienced it personally with major events like 9-11, anything like that. The second something happens, I'm sure it was the same thing with Pearl Harbor, uh, there is a uh, an understanding that we all need to close ranks. And I understand that too. It makes sense that in a you know Hurricane Katrina, an emergency, you want to close ranks and everybody uh, – dig in and and help uh but in these kinds of instances like the boston bombing there is nothing for us to do actually and yet we still feel this need to get out there you know plant flags uh participate in memorial services so we need that we need that kind of catharsis and so along comes this stinker who says well you know there's some things that don't really add up and so we lash out at them we label them kooks or something we don't really even want to hear uh whether we ought to question the authorities and yet uh i mean watch the republican debates it's all about how you can't trust washington yeah the, the, it's, it is pretty funny how that works there's a great uh, i actually just had somebody from the film company free mind films and they did a great documentary called state of mind the psychology of control and it really it's a it's a great historical movie on like you said those in power and and 
they, they understand the psychology of how to keep people uh, making emotional decisions and kind of this herd type thinking of keeping people going along with the uh, with the group. And uh, it really is a method that's been uh, used for, for generations. And, and like you said, it happened after September 11th. Uh, I remember reading polls about how many people thought that Iraq and Saddam had something to do with September 11th after September 11th, because they just kept relating the two words. They kept saying September 11th, then in, in the same sentence or uh, a sentence uh, soon after, they would bring up Saddam and Iraq. So people were, were relating the two. And then I think it was like something like 80% of the U.S. thought that they had something to do with it, just because of pro probably, like you said, the emotional thing of everybody's worked up, everybody's very patriotic, everybody's upset, they feel like they have to do something. And like you said, you know, when, when we think emotionally and not logically, that's when people can really take advantage of us. And, and the other thing you see is uh, how people were clapping after they caught the, 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 the younger brother. And it's like you guys just had a police state in Boston and everybody's clapping like they're, they're excited. The fact that for and, and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that I, I don't want to minimize um, all the people who lost limbs and everything that's happened. And, you know, obviously there's three deaths and, and, and that's more than anybody wants to see. And um, but it was amazing how big of a story it was when really I remember when it first happened, I'm like, you know, three people died and they're really like it's it's literally seems like it was the next September 11th, like it was a next terrorist attack. And I don't know if that was on purpose or, or whatnot, but it, it kind of seemed like it. It seemed like they were before they had all the information, they were kind of making us feel like it was a terrorist attack. It, is that an accurate, uh, I guess, memory of what of the how the media was talking about the story? Yeah, I mean, let me explain. Uh, let me provide a comparison, if I may. Uh, James Holmes killed twelve people. You, as you were mentioning, three people died in the Boston Marathon bombing. He killed twelve people and he wounded seventy. Okay, now I don't know what the stats are in terms of uh, 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 dismemberment and things like that, uh, but I think if you compared the two, you could probably show that James Holmes caused more damage. As, as you know, he he certainly killed four times as many people, and he uh, will spend. Uh, the rest of his life in prison. Now, uh, Jahar Sarnayev, who uh, was the younger brother of the person who is presented as the key, uh, the perpetrator, uh, has been sentenced to death. So right away you have to say, why is this one getting death and the other getting uh, life in prison? Now you can talk about the, the jurisdiction and the state of mind of the you know the the political atmosphere in each of these places and so on. But but the fact is. Uh, you know, Massachusetts is supposedly a sort of a liberal state, uh, I think more so than Colorado, uh, and yet uh, a harsher uh, sentence. And that raises the question, why? And then the answer is, it's because there was a need for that kind of closure, which raises the question, why? And, 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 and I think you're, you're absolutely correct. Look, uh, we know that the leadership in the United States has fabricated wars and justifications for wars. This is not even in dispute. And you brought up the example of falsely trying to conflate stuff with Saddam Hussein. On our website, Who, What, Why, we were among, uh, uh, really, I, as far as I know, the only news organization to question the U.S. invasion of Libya uh, and the reasons and a lot of the stuff that we have heard about uh, Gaddafi, which turn, turns out, unless I'm not defending the man, but, I mean, turns out to have been grossly exaggerated, much of it even made up. Uh, and, and this is what you do, you know, uh, I think any thinking person realizes that when they want to convince somebody of something so that they can get some advantage, they will say whatever they can get away with, uh, in order to 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 convince the person and and gain that advantage, uh, they only stop when the person uh, challenges them. Um, and I mean, Donald Trump is a perfect example of this. He's he's a man who has essentially lied throughout his career, uh, and yet there he is up there lecturing us about being honest and open. Um, but uh, so so we 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 don't seem to have any standards for any of this stuff. And certainly, I'm happy to talk about the Boston bombing. Uh, uh, and and a, a whole bunch of these things and how they do fit in to the expansion of the security state and the loss of our own civil liberties and and other rights. Well, yeah, because the, the funny thing is that I, it, when they caught them or I think in the process of catching them or looking for them in Boston, because I'm from Massachusetts, so I know how big of a story it, it, it was. And 
when when they were looking for him, I was actually it was uh, my birthday's April nineteenth, so I know they caught him or they were looking for him sometime around that time. And we're at a bar celebrating my birthday with a couple of friends, and one of my good friends, who's a police officer, is like, "They shut down the whole city, but usually when and uh, and he's a detective, he's like, your best." help to catch somebody is the public their eyes and ears the tips you get and uh of course soon after they open up uh or they get rid of the police state they let people leave their homes and somebody spots them and they catch him and he was right and so this whole idea of like shutting down a whole city for like you said three people and i'm glad you made that james holmes comparison because that's something i just recently in the news and i never even put the two and two together that you're absolutely right he killed many more people he got life in prison and this guy's gonna get uh you know possibly the death penalty so it, it's it's amazing how they justify it and, and like you said they've used historically they've always used these type of things to justify um losing our freedoms and then securities and it gets to a point where it's just like you know, when are we basically contradicting our whole purpose of, of we're trying to protect ourselves, but really, I mean, I'm not sure we've got, I mean, the Boston, I guess my point is the Boston bombing happened, even though they kept taking away securities and freedoms and stuff like that to try to make us safer and things like that continue to happen. You're not going to stop that. So what's the point of taking away everybody's freedoms? So when you were looking into the Boston bombing, what, what was the part of the story that made the least sense or the part, where, where was there a giant hole that you're like, okay, it's something about this doesn't necessarily make sense. Well, I mean, I have to say that as an investigative journalist, I rely a lot on a kind of a sixth sense about things. Uh, and that is not uh, just really an imaginary thing. It comes from experience. You've seen enough things, you've read enough things, and you see patterns. And Right when the bombing happened, I actually got a bad feeling beyond just the bad feeling you get from the bombing itself. Uh, I, I immediately thought the, the symbolism of it, uh, the Boston Marathon, uh, Patriots Day, uh, uh, Tax Day, you know, it all happened. All these factors came together and then a bomb went off. And so my first thought was, what, whoever's behind or whatever's behind this, uh, they either lucked out or they were aware of the tremendous sort of trifecta of symbolism. Um, and so that struck me. Uh, and that's just, I think, ra uh, rational uh, uh, way of looking at something as soon as it happens that, that you could say that these people were aware of the symbolism there as opposed to uh, planting a bomb uh, in a shopping center in Omaha on you know, some random Saturday. I mean, there's a big difference. So that struck me right away. And I wanted to know, therefore, what that symbolism was about. Now, if you think about it, um, we are told this is Islamic terrorism. Uh, and yet, the first thing that occurred to me was, well, what do Islamic terrorists do? Well, number one, uh, they become martyrs. So they don't fear death. They cause death in others. And then they basically... Have, they themselves die. So that didn't happen here. Nobody uh, nobody that we know of, no perpetrator, uh, died directly after this dramatic event. The second thing I thought of is that what they always do is they, they're looking for the symbolism and they're looking to make a political statement. Uh, that's almost always the case. I mean, Charlie Hebdo and so on. What was the political statement they made here? There was none. There was no political statement made. These people who, uh, okay, and I, I'm going to still use the term alleged because I believe a lot has not come out yet. But in any case, these people uh, uh, found, uh, well, the older brother was not tried, but so I'll use the term alleged. But anyway, the, these alleged perpetrators uh, were, were at the marathon bombing. We know that uh, from video. Uh, and we know that they then went on with their lives like – Everybody else at the thing who was not injured, you know, uh, they, you know, the older brother went back to his wife and kid in Cambridge and the younger brother went back to his college dorm. They even stopped to buy milk um, right after it. In fact, they not only bought milk, but then the younger brother came back into the store to exchange it for another milk. You know, very, very odd. Not not the normal behavior of Islamic fundamentalists. But the key point is they never claimed credit for this. And they, they, they didn't act in any way, shape, or form like the prototypical uh, Islamic uh, uh, fundamentalist terrorist. And so it doesn't fit. That's the first thing. This